we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, Zanes Paul, is that okay with you guys? Okay. Um, I think more people will trickle in, but thank you everybody for joining us for our Young Professionals Lunch and Learn on Planning 101. Uh, we're fortunate today to have Zendo Kern. He is the County of Hawaii Planning Director. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Taylor Escalona, and I am the Membership Administrator in Marketing for the Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce. Um, just wanted to share that it's nice to see all of you virtually, and we hope to see you in person at our events coming up in the next couple months. Um, but really quick, we just wanted to go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves so that we all kind of know a little bit about each other. Um, I will start with Kapono and then go to Chuck. Aloha everyone, I'm Kapono Pa. I am a realtor, broker, and broker in charge at Salvio Realty in Pahoa. Also a member of Hawaii Island Realtors, where I serve as government affairs committee chairperson and a bunch of other volunteer positions that would be too long to name. Thank you. Chuck, are you able to unmute and introduce yourself? Okay, we'll come back to Chuck and Lara. Uh, Richard, if you're able to go ahead. Me? Yeah, I'm Richard Anderson, realtor with RSM. Thank also you. Also on the Government Affairs Committee. Thank you. And then we'll have Ashley and then Steve. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ashley. I'm a commercial banking officer with Bank of Hawaii. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Weta. Uh, I'm CEO of Suisun Company. Thank you. And then we'll have Bryn and then Dave Deleuze. Hi there, everyone. My name is Bryn Whithans. I am a commercial banking associate at First Hawaiian Bank. And uh, I'm excited to uh, join everyone today. Hi, good morning. David Deleuze Jr., David S. Senior Deleuze Enterprises. Um, glad to be here and looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you, uh, Doug Adams and then Jessica. Yeah, Doug Adams, designated survivor at the county, and I don't get enough of Zendo, so I have to be honest. Hello, I'm Jessica. I'm a project engineer with RLB. Thank you. And then we'll do Alexander and then Antonia. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. I am also a commercial banking associate at First Hawaiian Bank. And nice to see you again, Zendo. And looking forward to the presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Antonia. I'm also with Rider Love at Bucknell. So happy to have Jessica over there. Um, she is on Hawaii Island. I'm in Honolulu. So I'm excited to learn more about the permitting process and planning from the Hawaii County perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And then we'll do Leinani and then we'll go back to Chuck and Lara. Aloha everyone, I'm Leinani Lozi. I'm the new Hawaii Community Outreach Specialist at the 30 Meter Telescope Project. Um, I've also been living in Hilo since 2013, so I'm really just interested to learn about how to make positive impact in our community through planning and working with the county. Hi, I'll go since I didn't hear Chuck go yet. Um, my name is Lara Sonoda. I'm a first, uh, banker at First Hawaiian Bank, commercial banking group. Thank you. Do, does sure. Chuck want to introduce himself or? I think he's trying to intro himself, but he's muted. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, Chuck Erskine. I don't follow instructions very well. 
and I'm technologically challenged, but I work for First Hawaiian Commercial Banker. Nice to see everyone, and thanks, Zendo, for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck. And then I just saw Kaleo. Did you want to introduce yourself? Excuse me, you're talking to me? Yes, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, hi, my name's Khalil Wong. I'm from Prince William Plaza. I'm the operations manager here. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I would now like to call on Paul Kalani Shook. She is one of the co-chairs of the Young Professionals Program. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay. All right, awesome. Um, mahalo, Taylor. Hello, my kako. Uh, my name is Paola, and I'm a regional manager for Teach for America Hawaii, um, which is an educational nonprofit organization that recruits and develops lifelong leaders working towards expanding educational equity in our communities. So coming from a pretty different sector <laughs> from most folks here, um, and excited to learn a ton of new things. Um, but I'm super grateful to be able to continue strengthening my own leadership through the opportunity to be part of the Young Professionals Committee within the Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce. Um, YP, <clears throat> as we like to call it, was created in 2018 um, as a way for young professionals to develop their professional network, learn about various topics and discuss issues um, relevant to our age group or this particular stage in our careers. Um, since then, YP has grown a bunch um, to over 50 members who are all not just um, active in their professional lives, but out of work as well, volunteering for chamber events and out in the community. Our committee has hosted events spanning from PD sessions on home ownership, retirement planning, life and supplemental insurance, government policies, and more. Um, to social events, including sake tasting at HPM Building Supply, mixology class um, with the Grand Nani Loa Hotel, Pauhana um, at the Temple Bar, a hike to the Kaulana Manuki Puka Bird Trail, and virtual game nights um, during COVID. Last month, we were, we were also able to host a free public community career fair at the Civic, which featured around 40 business vendors, um, and last year, we were able to hold our inaugural Young Professionals Recognition Gala, in which we celebrated the achievements of four deserving young professionals in our community um, and presented the first Young Professional of the Year Award. And so, um, as YP continues to grow here at the Chamber, we will also be planning a roundtable discussion event soon to really just hear what the concerns of the YPs um, are and how our policymakers, business leaders, and community can help. Um, and this is sort of our vision, um, if folks can see that. The vision of the YP is to find like-minded professionals who are starting off in their careers, build a network, referral sources, grow and learn together. And so with that, we ask our chamber members to help spread the word about YP and encourage any of your employees between the ages of 21 to 39 or um, folks that you know to participate in YP events or, or join our committee. We do meet every second Thursday of the month via Zoom at 4 p.m. So send yourself or others you know who might be interested our way so that we can add folks to our meetings. Uh, mahalo and I will send the floor back to Taylor. Sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't usually do this. Um, okay, I'm unmuted now. Thank you, Paul, for sharing that introduction about YP and what they do. Um, I would now like to call on Dennis Lin, who is the other co-chair of the Young Professionals Program. At this time, I wanna welcome um, Planning Director Zendo Kern of the County of Hawaii Planning Department. So Zendo Kern was born on the island of Hawaii in North Kohala and raised in Wa'awa'a in the district of Puna. Born and raised on Hawaii Island, 
provide the general a unique perspective which has served his personal and professional life for the last two decades. From growing up completely off-grid, surfing the rocky coast of Poike, to socializing with a diverse socioeconomic mix has allowed Zendo to have a deep connection to this island and the people who call Hawaii Island home. Zendo has spent the last 20 years in development, land use planning, and serving in the public sector, specializing in green building and land use planning with a focus on solution-based problem solving. Uh, during his public service, Zendo was the chairman of the Windward Planning Commission and served as a council member for District 5. Currently, Zendo serves as the Hawaii County Planning Director. These unique experiences of growing up on Hawaii Island make Zendo a uh, qualified individual to lead the planning department. At this time, uh, I'd like to welcome Zendo Kern. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the nice intro. Uh, thank you, Taylor, for the intro and early conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, really look forward to the opportunity to talk story, uh, hopefully share um, some information to help maybe paint a better, uh, clearer picture on what land use is about. Uh, hopefully some of what I'm talking about rings true and I can move away from here, you know, really feeling a bit more grounded in, in maybe how we got to this place and solutions moving forward, or at least understand maybe what zoning is. Um, you know, the young professional side of it is uh, really neat. Uh, I think it's really close to, to my heart as well. I started out um, quite young in, in business and my pathway to get here was not your normal pathway. It was a lot of uh, night class at the School of Hard Knocks, if you will. And so this journey and support from uh, mentors, folks in our community, really played a, a big role in that. And so, you know, got some familiar faces on here. So when folks like, you know, Chuck, for example, support, you know, I, I know like Dave Hanma for a long, long time, he's always supported me along this journey. That's been neat. And, um, one thing that wasn't mentioned that I don't really talk about that often, but I think some of you folks might appreciate is uh, 2007, I was the uh, recipient of the Small Business Administration Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for the county. And I, I say that only because there's, there's a lot of opportunity here in Hawaii County. And uh, I think if you put your, your head down and, and move forward in a very uh, pono and, and good way, there's lots of things that can become available to you. Uh, if I was able to do it, I think, Pretty much anybody else can do it. So, um, and also congratulations to Dennis. Uh, he is now chairman of the Wimmer Planning Commission. Yay, that's a big deal. Uh, got to serve there as well. So that that's really really awesome. Okay, let's talk land use. One of my favorite subjects. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, and then I'm going to roll into uh, a PowerPoint. I'm not going to read all the PowerPoints. I'm just going to roll, go through things and, and really try to get a higher level view and hopefully end up with enough time for some Q&A at the end of it. Okay, land use. Everybody here is probably semi-familiar with land use or is completely confused on land use. So y'all probably have one of these now, right? Smartphone. Let's talk about land use from a, a perspective of smartphone. Land use is really the intellectual property of real estate, if you will. And so it's something that isn't seen all the time, but it comes out to be seen. Um, I feel it's some of the biggest opportunity uh, that we have and some of the biggest challenges that we have moving forward. And that's why I think I've gravitated towards it from my uh, experience from developing vertical, horizontal, all the way through to land use. I love solving problems. And land use, I think, is one of those really big challenges. So I'm, I lean into, into those things. So from the from example of a cell phone, I want you to think about land use this way. You have an operating system on your cell phone, right? Whether it be Apple, Android, and it's running there in the background. You don't really think about it that much, but it's there. That's the underlying land use. Your app on your phone that you wanna use is the use that you're actually trying to go for. So let's say you want an office. The land use will govern what you can do. The app would be your office and the actual phone would be your hardware, which would actually be built if that more or less makes sense. So this thing land use, it's always operating in the background. It's always there, it's always present. And how did this place become the way that it was and developed? Land use 
rules and regulations or therefore lack of land use rules and regulations. So it's really, really interesting. So for today, we're going to kind of go do a, a top to bottom kind of run through on land use, but we're also going to use an example to do this because I don't think just saying here's what zoning is, we have a dual system is really going to get you to where you want to go. Let's actually relate this to a project as we move forward. So everyone's pretty much familiar with White Kaloa Beach Resort, right? Okay, we're going to use that kind of as, a, as, a, as, our, as our ground uh, to move along. So at one point in time, White Kaloa Beach Resort was just a field of lava, right? Just a field of lava. And over time, it's developed into multiple, you know, hotels, timeshares, beautiful palm trees, etc. So we're going to, as we move along, I'm going to give examples of, you know, Waikoloa like and how it actually relates to, to doing this. And um, well, I'll go also go into some other areas. So uh, this should be interesting. And if I've said something that's completely foreign, um, you're happy, welcome to interrupt me at any given time and try to get some clarification from me. So let's see if this works. Can you see? Yeah, so, okay, so I'm not going to go through and read this, but, you know, why is zoning really necessary? So zoning is really, it's our, it's, it's, it's our guide, it's our rules of how things take place and actually keep controls over folks. There's a few places that don't have zoning. Um, the one that works the best is Japan, and the concept around that is the folks really respect each other, so it works. Now, most of the world that doesn't work so zoning kind of separates those uses um whether it be industrial to commercial to residential and it effectuates how we're actually going to grow um and it's usually from more of like an urban core out so hawaii is really unique in the sense that it has uh two regulatory systems it's got a underlying state land use system and then it has an overlying uh, county system and we'll go through that a little bit but most other places don't have this and this actually makes Hawaii really really tricky to deal with and I'll explain more. So we have our state land use classifications and we have our county zoning. So Waikolo Beach Resort sitting there it's a large huge big parcel multiple parcels that's sitting there uh, originally it was state land use agriculture so at, at which point in time county zoning came around in 1967 um, basically went around and said okay this area well, let's back up real quick how did outside of post contact how did the big island really get constructed and built we think about it plantation built it that's why we have all these towns. That's why there was so much parks and recs facilities, say along the Hamakua coast. Kailua Kona was lacking. Kailua Kona was really just a fishing village. Now it's a place where a lot of people want to go. And we often wonder why was it this way? Well, it was developed during that time by the plantation, plantation really driven towards, you know, the e economics of the plantation. And what's interesting is we're actually taking a step back with land use planning and we're closer to uh, plantation era than we were. So what happened was we had this kind of more plantation industrialization. And then from there, we turned into a bit more sprawl and suburban, right? Sprawl, spread out, suburbanization. And now when you hear the concept live, work, play, transit oriented, transit -oriented development, et cetera, we're coming back to a tighter density where you can have that live, work, play. What did the plantations actually do? Well, it was live, work, play. It was, here's our, we're going to live here, we're going to shop here, we're going to work here. We're all in that same area. So Big Island was kind of done that way. Now, moving back to Waikoloa, um, that was just state land use ag. So you have this underlying state land use and the, and the county zoning was agriculture. So it's just a, a, a piece of dirt ag and it's uh, basically sitting there um, not doing anything. What we have here is just kind of a general hierarchy. I'll get into more. We have state land use, which governs everything. It's the ultimate operating system underneath here. We have a general plan, which is our policy document for the island, which really uh, dictates where growth is going to occur. 
how, how growth is going to occur. Where are we going to focus that? What areas are we going to preserve, et cetera? That drills down to our zoning, which would be through chapter 25, which basically talks about all the uses, which we'll get into here in a little bit. And then I put subdivisions in there, not so much that it, it effectuates to a subdivision, but it effectuates to some type of regulatory entitlement. And that entitlement is basically your ability to do something on that land. So if you have the proper zoning that will allow you to split it into a certain amount of lots and you're entitled to do that subdivision, we would process that, process that within the department. So uh, chapter HRS 205 is really that state land use governing uh, body, body. And there's uh, four designations for it. So you have conservation, you have agriculture, rural, and urban. So conservation, very familiar with conservation. We have it along certain areas of the coast, uh, Malka, large swaths of land. Agriculture, most of our island is agriculture. Now, again, a lot of it was done as a placeholder. Some of it makes sense, some of it doesn't, but it gets to be a very convoluted, complex conversation these days because um, NIMBYs use it a lot to say, we don't want anything to happen here, even though it's like, say, just barren rock, but it's still somehow agriculture because it's all zoned that. So the placeholder was there. So you can see the percentages of really what we have. Um, something that's always uh, stuck out to me was this rural concept. So we have a rural state land use and a rural zoning. And we're pretty rural by nature, but we only have 0.003% of rural, 807 acres in total. So the entire Maka Lake golf course property is larger than the amount of rural land we actually have on the island. So those are the, the, the four underlying areas. So if you're conservation, you're very limited on what you can do. If you're agriculture, you're really driven by the, the ag component. Um, if you're rural, it allows for some agriculture uses, but it also allows for smaller, a little smaller lot size, and a little bit more residential mix within that. Uh, and then if you're urban, urban is really your, your, your urban core, your town center. So like Hilo, that's urban. If you look at like Honoka'a town, that's urban. You look at, uh, uh, Waimea or Kailua proper, that's urban. And all of those areas are that urban core, that urban growth. You probably have heard that. And then on top of this, we'll actually have certain zonings that go into it. So the county zoning, um, blah, 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 is the overlay that goes on to this. So you generally, Waikoloa, I want to do a master plan resort community. Right, I want to build these homes, I want to do all this. My state land use is ag. That doesn't provide me to do that. What's the state land use I need to get to in order to allow all of these uses? That state land use I need to get to would be urban. So in order to do that, you actually have to go through a state land use boundary amendment. And that happens at the state land use commission. So here in Hawaii County, if it's less than 15 acres in size, the county council can actually approve, approve a state land use boundary amendment. But the size of anything larger than 15 acres has to go to the state land use commission. The state land use commission is comprised of uh, commissioners made up from all the various islands. And it's a very, it's a, it's a quasi judicial process. It's very intense, it's lengthy and it's expensive. So Waikoloa said, oh, we wanted to change this. The first thing that they had to do is they had to come up with a whole master plan of what they wanted. And then they would have to present that at, to the state land use commission to change the underlying state land use before anything can move forward that underlying state land use has to change. So they go through it, they change that whole area to urban. And they put conditions on there and the conditions will say you have to deal with traffic, you got to put so much money for affordable housing, you got to put an area for a school, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was the first step in doing that. Same thing happened with uh, most other developments here. And one of the areas we run into right now is people not wanting to go to the State Land Use Commission. So Kailua Kona proper, a lot of the, the low-hanging fruit's been developed, um, and a lot of the other areas where we really need to kind of infill is actually still state land use ag. In order to change that, it's got to go to state land use uh, urban, which goes through this really lengthy process. So it's very, that's, that's, a, that's a layer that we process through, but it exists there where most other places don't have this layer. It's basically county zoning, and you deal with the county on these things. But this is really, really tricky. I was, um, I tried really hard this last legislative session to have a bill come through to change uh, the county's ability to do up to 50 acres of state, state land use boundary amendment uh, when it was for a project of 60% or more affordable. 
affordable homes. And I thought that was a good uh, idea to kind of show the state that the county is, you know, matured and this would be something that we can take on. It got very political. The state Land Use Commission didn't like it and the bill ended up uh, getting shut down. So I will try again this next go around. But we need more tools and home rules, something I feel very important. Uh, that's very important. So various zonings now that would go on top of that, um, depending, so like RS, RD, RM, RCX, those are all proper zonings for a urban state land use designation. Your, where did I go here? Your RA, that's going to be more of your rural designation. Your FA, that would also be more rural or ag. And then your um, agriculture, your IA um, would be uh, more your, your agriculture state land use. Now, the V for resort, CN, commercial CG, et cetera, um, and all the rest of these down to open, all of those need to be state land use urban for those to actually operate. If it's not state land use urban, you're not operating. So we look at it and we say, what's the state land use? If it's say ag and needs to go to here, then we tell the person you need to go to um, state land use urban, go through that process. So Waikoloa Beach Resort, again, they have a myriad of different zonings in there. They have a uh, reset, they have a uh, resort, and some C CV, I believe, in there. And those zonings give a myriad of different uses from whether it be a hotel to multifamily to um, uh, commercial, retail, et cetera. It gives all of those. So within here, there's a, there's a ton of different uses that, that regulate that. So Waikoloa then comes in and says, we got our state land use squared. Now let's come and let's actually do the zoning. What's the proper zoning for us? Where in this case, again, it was pretty much resort and some other commercial uh, mixture. So then they actually came in with an application that met all of the same stuff that they put together for the state land use boundary amendment. And the package would go through the planning department. We would review the application. We would then get uh, um, comments from all the different agencies. So Department of Public Works, State Health, uh, State Historic Preservation Division, all of these different uh, agencies will comment back to us. And we will then create a background report and a recommendation uh, to move forward. Uh, for example, some of you might have heard of the Kumaho project that was just recently approved last year for a number of timeshares in Waikoloa. Um, that application package was close to a thousand pages of various studies, reports, et cetera, it's from TIAR's traffic impact analysis reports to um, uh, all kinds of other stuff. And so that package would come through. We would review that against the general plan and against the CDP. And if it makes sense, we could then move forward supporting that. From there, it has to go to the planning commission, depending on what side of the island the project's on, it would go to the planning commission. At the time Waikoloa happened, there was one planning commission for the entire island. Around 2008, they split it. Now there's a windward planning commission and a leeward planning commission. Dennis is the chair of the windward planning commission, which pretty much takes care of um, the wet side of Waimea all the way down to Ocean View, and the Leeward Planning Commission takes care of the remainder on the west side of the island. So depending on where it goes, if we were doing it today, it would go to the Leeward Planning Commission. They would go through that review process, and at, for a zoning, they would make a recommendation and possibly amend or adjust conditions to that. So they can tweak with the application at that process. Um, at that point, it's advisory either to send it forward with, to the county council with a favorable recommendation or an unfavorable recommendation. And then it would move its way up to the county council uh, for an actual final vote and, and decision. And this is one of the big reasons why, you know, having council members that you that you or that you're in alignment with is really, really critical. Because even from the planning department, we're limited on what we can do. We can support things, we can get things moving, but the final change for the for the actual rezoning comes from the county council. So real quick, I'm going to digress. Um, one of the challenges that we have with uh, with housing is we don't have a lot enough units, which means we need to get projects moving through our department, through the commission, to the county council to actually effectuate more zoning, to effectuate more units to come through. Very, very critical. So again, we look at that application for the rezoning. We look at it against the general plan. The general plan is our guiding policy document for the island. I think it's the most, one of the most important documents we have on the island. We're going through a review right now. 
historically, the general plan was supposed to be that guide where the roads are going to go in, where infrastructure priorities are, um, how we're actually going to solve for the, some of these things. And it's the ultimate land use guide, land use policy. So we have sections that relate to all of these areas within the zoning and say, here's what we'd like to see. Here's what we want to do it. We have these maps. If I have enough time, we'll open up a map and show you guys. But this is this to me is so critical. This The plan needs to be dynamic. It needs to be uh, forward thinking. So for example, in the new version of the general plan, we're actually putting in a whole section for climate change within there that's never existed before. And so we will be, we're stabilizing the plan right now and getting the plan to county council in the beginning of 2024. So there's an opportunity for you folks to be involved in this as well. Uh, as I said, it's enacted, it is a, uh, enacted by uh, county council as an ordinance. And it's a similar process that the planning department has taken in a bunch of uh, information we've prepared, and now we're moving it forward through a stabilization process. Um, as I said, there's a whole map section on it or a LUPEG map, a land use pattern allocation guide map that more or less shows the settlement patterns on how we want it to grow. So if you think of like the urban core and then it goes out from there, you can have your tighter density within and then it gets less and less to finally being more just like ag or conservation on the outside of it. Again, also includes facilities for, um, you know, roadways, et cetera. Again, most important is what we base our land use policies off of. So if, if you're needing to do something, you've got to look at the general plan. Is it consistent? So in this case of Waikoloa, um, the general plan at the time was consistent. So this is where we want a resort note to be. This is where we want it to be. So when they reviewed it, it said, this, this is what we want. Let's move forward with it. If it doesn't meet that criteria from a planning department's perspective, we can't support it. You can ask to amend the general plan in that process, but that's another level of complexity uh, that the planning department may or may not support. Then we move into community development plans. So the CDPs started in around 2008 with Puna and then made their way around, around the island. CDPs are very mixed uh, reviews. Um, they kind of got out of control. They were supposed to be kind of a community planning document guideline for, for, um, for folks to get together more as a community and do it. And through those plans, uh, some good came out of it, some challenge came out of it. But what happened was there was a court case, uh, the Metzler case uh, happened, shoot, at least maybe six or seven years ago now. And that court case, basically the judge said that the CDP is law. We have to follow that now too. So we actually have to review all of these applications against the CDP. Very interesting. So Pohoa, uh, Puna had the first CDP and there were two members of the CDP steering committee that were very adamant about getting this plan done. Pass it now, amend it later. Let's go. Some of you may remember that, some of you may not. So anyways, this plan got pushed through and rushed, rushed through and I had a lot of issues with it at the time, but it got adopted. At the time it was adopted saying, it's just the kind of a guide, don't worry about it. The general plan still trumps and you can just look at the CDP and maybe agree with it, maybe not. But that Messler case basically said CDP is law, so you have to follow this now. So it added a layer of complexity. Uh, when I was in the private practice, I had a, a, um, a uh, person I was working for, a client, that wanted to do something in Pohoa. And it was a family business. It was a, a feed and fertilizer store and they had to move from their current location to a new location. And so we looked at it and I said, you know, this is a really good thing. I think we'll, I think we'll get it going. Put together a whole petition, got 250 signatures, not a single person uh, in opposite, well, maybe one person in opposition with it, but that's like really good for being in Pohoa area. Um, however, it was not consistent with the CDP. And so the planning department at the time couldn't support it. And so we said, hey, let's move forward with this anyways. I think I, think I can get the planning commission to, to get on board with us. And there were two, the two original members of the, of the steering committee, very, um, very longstanding folks within our community, very, um, hey, uh, I have a lot of ideas, and a lot of opinions. And so they really supported this project and they actually came to the planning commission hearing and they said, we know that the CDP doesn't support it, but the CDP is out of date and, it, and, and, and this project is good. This project needs to happen. Please support this project. 
Planning Commission shut it down because the CDP wasn't consistent with it. So even the, the authors of it were for it, but because of that, it got shut down. So we've created this beast of CDPs. Kona is another really, really good example. Uh, the Kona Community Development Plan was initiated and um, it basically had concurrency requirements in it. Concurrency requirements said this road, this certain roadway needs to be built or this roadway needs to be built. This needs to happen before anything else can be done. And what happened was that it essentially created a moratorium on zoning. So for 10 years, no new projects were happening in Kona based on the CDP. Only two years ago or so was the CDP amended to adjust the language to allow to not have it be so strict for these concurrency requirements. But what did that do for Kailua Kona? Stopped projects, the man was still there, economics 101 kick in, limited supply, high demand, price increase, price increase, price increase, price increase, price increase. And what happens is locals can't even support, can't live there anymore, so they leave. And yet the plan I think is intended was to try to keep it the way that it was or more so we don't want it to be a certain way. And that's very dangerous. Um, so that, th those are some of the effects that we have around the CDP. At the time when Waikoloa went in, there was no CDP. So there wasn't anything we had to go uh, like really work through with this. Um, so this is again, that CDPs are new to, um, to uh, 2008-ish. And now we have six of them and they're outdated by the minute. So, you know, the purpose of zoning uh, is to promote uh, health and safety, general, you know, regulate the height, size of buildings, structures, all of those elements that we would regulate for how that app would actually work, right? How does that actually work? So it's all this underlying um, work. So density, setbacks, et cetera. And each zoning has its own criteria that we would that we would have for that. If you ever want to get into a chapter 25, uh, has all of our zoning. That's really our, our primary document for all zoning. It'll talk about setbacks. It'll talk about the various um, zones and what can be used um, with, or what can be done within those zones. We're going to fly through this. Uh, again, no zoning until 1967. Sometimes people might hear about a non-conforming use that was being done, or why is there a store operating there and it doesn't make any sense? Well, maybe that store started in 1960 and never stopped. That would be considered non-conforming, so they'd be allowed to maintain their use. If they stop for a year, um, then they would lose their non-conforming use. When you hear that, it's basically the same thing as grandfathering them in. They were grandfathered in. Okay, y'all can read that. Um, so for example, um, it creates the density control. So RS, RS means uh, residential. So RS 10 is a residential 10,000 square feet. So which means a lim minimum lot size is 10,000 square feet per lot. So if you're going to subdivide and you have a 22,000 square foot lot and you were zoned RS 10, we could say, yes, we could subdivide you. Now, if you had 19,000 square feet and you were zoned RS 10, not going to be able to subdivide it because you can't get two 10,000 square foot lots. It has to have mathematical correctness as it relates to that. Uh, similar with the RM, the RM would be multifamily residential and you could do um, one uh, dwelling unit per 2.5, um, excuse me, 2,500 2, square feet of land. So if you had 10,000 square feet, you could do four units. Um, can do zonings to, uh, we can amend, amend the zoning code, et cetera. We're actually starting a comprehensive overhaul of the zoning code and subdivision code. The zoning code was updated in 1996, uh, excuse me, was created, or the last update to the zoning code was 1996. Our subdivision code is 1983, so slightly out of date. Okay, another complexity that we run into um, that's unique for Hawaii is our special management area. So we talked about our state land use, the governing area there. We have our overlay of zoning that's gonna regulate what you can do on it. Is it for ag? Is it for residential? Here's the myriad of uses you can do. Here's your setbacks, here's your heights, all of those. Then we get into SMA or the special management area. And the special management area encompasses the entire island around the coast. Some areas come in a few hundred feet, some areas come in around a uh, half a mile. And if you're in this area, there's a higher level of scrutiny and an additional permit that goes along with it. So Waikoloa was in the SMA as well. So they actually had to go through a whole SMA process and 
who approves the SMAs, planning commission approves the SMAs. So planning commission is a really, really critical um, uh, body and it's a very critical position because planning commission actually makes decisions on many different applications, not just advisory as some people think. The only thing that they actually advise on are rezones and state land use boundary amendments. Um, we get into a few nuances, but that kind of high level takes care of that. SMA, use permits, special permits, things of that nature, the Planning Commission actually has the final decision on, unless it's a special permit that exceeds 15 acres, in which case it goes through the Planning Commission, then back up to the State Land Use Commission. So with the SMA, we have to, we really have to evaluate it through a whole nother application process. Um, you got to go through whether it's defined as development. In certain cases, um, it would be. So if I'm going to build a um, like a, a subdivision and it exceeds that $500,000 threshold, I'm gonna to have to do an SMA major, uh, which actually goes through the planning commission. If it's less than that threshold, it's considered an SMA minor and the planning department itself processes that and I make the decision on that. Uh, as far as single family residential uh, homes go, most of all of those are exempt. We look at it uh, and give it an exemption and we sign off on it. However, uh, two years ago now, um, state legislature um, passed Act 16, which said there's no more single family residential exemptions along the coastline. So if you're short, if you're oceanfront property, you hit that uh, $500,000 threshold, you have to go for an SMA major. There's nothing less than that now. Or before it was exempt up to 7,500 square feet. A big, big difference. Very, very critical uh, application. We see a lot of uh, challenge around these. We see a lot of challenge, especially in the Kailua Kona area for this. Um, folks are allowed to challenge this by way of a contested case hearing. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to fly through this. So something to be very mindful of and another complexity of, of land use here in the islands. So those were kind of the discretionary permits, the permits that somebody would need approval from another body, whether it be the State Land Use Commission, the County Council, or a Planning Commission, with the exception of an SMA minor, which the Planning Director, um, Planning Department can, uh, can approve. Then you get into administrative permits. Administrative permits are handled within the department itself. And these are decisions that uh, we make or the director makes uh, based on criteria. So subdivision is a good one. If you have the zoning and you meet the criteria with water, et cetera, you're good. Grading and grubbing uh, happens at DPW and then we review it. Plan approval, anytime someone's doing a commercial uh, project, we look at plan approval. What, is the, what does plan approval mean? Well, we look at um, parking spaces. You have your number of parking spaces, your setbacks, your loading, your height, all of those elements, your landscaping. So all of that which goes on, um, around a commercial site. Why did it look like that? Why did we have it that way? It's based on certain code, certain regulations, and then a plan approval process that we go through as a department to sign off and approve, making sure it meets those. Um, building permits, we are not responsible for, build, for building permits. We review them based on land use. Um, we we look at uh, setbacks, heights, and was there, was there any zoning constraints that we need to look at that the person had to adhere to? Was there previous uh, conditions in a rezoning entitlement that would uh, effectuate something different? So quick, quickly, when I came into this position, the planning department had kind of a hard time processing building permits for whatever reason. Our West Hawaii office had a whole cubicle, cubicle full of building permits, over 180 uh, building permits to be exact, and would take around three months to process a single building permit. Uh, within four months, we no longer had a backlog and we processed building permits within a day, it's, or not three days, it usually takes us a couple hours to go through. So that backlog was gone. And so now the planning department doesn't have any backlog as it relates to building permits we process efficiently. When you hear about the challenges with EPIC and whatnot or building permits, that is within a different department. We're a reviewing agency for building permits. And variances. Uh, variances would be, um, if somebody, this happens frequently, somebody accidentally built their house into the side yard setback and they go to sell their home and they get a survey and all, and the survey shows that a corner of the property is sitting into the setback, which basically the setbacks are the open buffer areas around uh, the sides of the property and the front of the property, keeping that in open space. Now, if that house is in there, the person can uh, apply for a variance application that has to meet certain criteria. 
um, and the planning director will either um, approve it or deny it um, based on that criteria. But it's a whole separate, distinct process. And if the house is within the, is sitting within the setback, it's not consistent and compliant with zoning code. You get the variance, that variance approval allows it to be consistent and compliant with zoning code. So you have a complete property at that point in time. Uh, so that's just a little quick example about subdivisions, kind of like, a, for example, if you had a property that was 100 acres, uh, zoned Ag 5, A5A agriculture is the A, 5 is the minimum lot size. Um, so theoretically, you could do uh, 20 lots of five acres each, but you have to make sure that there's adequate water and roadways and other infrastructure. Um, for example, when the large subdivisions were put in in Pune that we're all very familiar with, that was done right before 1967 and these laws came into effect. So they were able to do what they called paper subdivisions. And that's why they don't have the same infrastructure that we have now with water, full paved roads and all of those things. It happened right before this change. Now when projects come in, they have to meet a much higher criteria, more current um, with what you see, um, say in town. Okay, yeah, so grading and grubbing, uh, basically it's, you know, just need to be compliant if you hit certain criteria, but it's very critical. Uh, plan approval, so most dogs uh, in, whether it be resort, commercial, industrial, really don't deal with this on single family residential uh, lots. That's where we just do a plan review of the plot plan, does not meet, okay, you're fine, good to go. This is a, a bit more uh, intense with parking, egress, landscaping, et cetera. Uh, building permits that I just explained, uh, and then the variances that we go through. So if somebody has a challenge with uh, one of the director's decisions, they can go ahead and go through the Board of Appeals. We actually have a board member present down here. Um, and that's how they would um, say, hey, you made a decision, whether it was a decision against the application so if I deny an application, let's say, they could appeal it. If I approve the application and a neighbor or surrounding property owner doesn't like it, they can appeal it. That's a separate body that the app that would go through, kind of like a little miniature court proceeding. And we would make our case and the other party would make their case. And at the end of the day, we might settle on something very similar to court or the Board of Appeals will make the final decision to either confirm with the director's decision or reverse director's decision. If it's outside and into a um, planning commission side of it, past the department, so discretionary, the appeals process is actually Third Circuit Court. And that's where they would go to file that appeal. And yeah, so here's some ways that uh, folks can either uh, get, in, get engaged um, with us. So the general plan update is currently happening right now. It was going on for a while. We came in and we're, let's say, going through a stabilization process. Um, that's the, rem rem the remainder of this year. We'll be back out for public comment and then going through the planning commissions for their review and comment and then making its way to county council. My goal is to have that drop to county council at the beginning of 2024. Uh, we just signed contracts for the, for the uh, code updates. So chapter 25 and 23, as I mentioned, the zoning code is uh, 1996 and subdivision code is 1983. We're doing top to bottom on those to get those more current and modern for our modern times. Uh, that'll also deal with, you know, mitigation, hazard mitigation, as well as tighter densities and ideally creating ways to create more cost-effective uh, solutions for folks to be able to build homes um, so we can keep people here. That's one of my big missions is I'm sick and tired of exporting our children off this island. If I have anything to do with it, they have the opportunity to stay or come back. And that's why I'm here. Um, and then oop, oop. Uh, there's community development plan action committees. So there's actually these action committees that if you're interested, you could become a member of the action committee if there's if they're open and you talk about things that are important within your community and you try to actually get projects done within there. Uh, we're working on making some adjustments to that. Uh, you can also apply for a board or commission to the mayor's office. Uh, so exact, for example, uh, Dennis serves on the Windward Planning Commission. Um, great commissioners, other commissions. I, I served on the Windward Planning Commission. I served on the water board. I know, uh, David, I believe you're still serving on there as well. So it doesn't necessarily just have to relate to, to land use, but there's other areas to get involved and get active. Um, and then as well as you could actually show up at public hearings and support um, 
projects. And from a young perspective, um, there's a group called Housing Hawaii's Future, which is a Wahoo uh, base right now that they're, that they're spanning out. And they've realized that we need to actually do something about the NIMBYs and we need to be a little more YIMBY. Yes, in my backyard. And so I'm seeing a, a group of millennials and Gen Zs coming together saying, we need housing, we need to support this, let's get involved. And they're actually coming out to... Um, to actually to like whether it be county council hearings, planning commission hearings, and supporting projects. Because what often happens is people that don't want it are the ones that show up. And it's it's sometimes a lot of pressure. So if we can get more people to show up to support what we want, that's a beautiful thing. And typically, let's say this is life kind of a, my life philosophy. We're either moving away from what we don't want or towards what we want. And when we're moving away from what we don't want, we're probably going to get just that. So, for example, what I hear a lot is, I don't want this, I don't want this island to be Oahu. Okay. What does that actually mean? You just don't want it to be, be Oahu, so we're looking at it differently. Versus, I want this island to be a place that's sustainable and I can raise a family here, I can be able to stay here, that, that uh, values the sense of place, the sense of culture that we've come from, et cetera. That's moving towards what we want. I think land use is this critical component to really continue to move towards what we would like. And I believe uh, getting more of the younger generation involved in this conversation is critical to creating and shaping an island community that we love. And so um, my contact info is on there, zendo.kern, or you can email the planning department, just have general questions or follow-up questions, uh, talk story, et cetera. And that's the end of my slide deck. Thanks for bearing with me on that one. And we will do that. And so that's your high level 101, pack it in there. Hopefully that made sense. Probably some of you are more confused than, than, than when we started. Um, but are there any questions? Thank you, Bando. Um, we do have one question in the chat here from Richard Henderson. He says, Zendo, my understanding is that the State Land Use Commission was created because there was no county planning department at the time. Now that we have individual, individual county planning departments, what is the need for State Land Use Commission? Can it be decommissioned by the legislature or restrict its activity strictly to the city um, and county of Honolulu? Well, yes, I, I, uh, it was created for that purpose. And what they've done, though, is now they have their hands in it and don't want to let it go. So the ability to change it is there, uh, most definitely. The political will to do so hasn't existed yet. So if it's going to be changed, it's going to be changed as, as a legislative action through the state Senate, state house to either change it so it doesn't exist or adjust it so it focuses on these other areas. But I will tell you right now that the leadership within there wants it, needs it, will fight for every single scrap on it. I thought going in for a, a, a larger amount of, of the, the county's ability to amend a larger area of land as it relates to affordable housing during this time would be really low hanging fruit and relatively simple. They battled it every single step of the way. So they don't have control over the state ledge though, but they do have other, other entities and other organizations that come in and lobby for them. So I would do away with it if I had my choice. Um, but it's gonna be a road to get there. At this time, does anybody else have any questions for uh, Planning Director Kern? If so, you can feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask the question. Aloha, I have a question. Um, mahalo for your talk. It was very interesting and I learned a lot. Um, but at the end, you talked a bit more about community members being able to get involved, especially like with affordable housing. And I'm wondering what's the best way to stay informed on like when the opportunities to get involved happen? If you just want to be involved as it relates to like, you know, code updates and public hearings and whatnot, you could email the general planning department um, email address and we can put you on our mailing 
list for various um, functions and activities as it relates to whether you could say code updates, CDP meetings, uh, planning commission hearing meetings, and then you'd be notified. Some folks we get, we send them an agenda for like planning commission hearings every single um, time it comes around. But I, I believe right now in the next um, year and a half or year is a prime time because we're looking at the general plan update. We're looking at the codes. So if you send me that, then we'll put you on the list as we're doing public outreach meetings and collecting information. Great, Mahalo. Uh, Zendo, Richie Henderson again. Um, I, I followed the community development plans and you know we've talked about them at our board of realtors and uh, in, in following the whole thing, it seems that it could be an important tool, as you mentioned, uh, to have in place the proper land use at the community development plan level to make it easier for you guys to approach the land use commission. So getting the community development plan as it relates to zoning and what we want to see happen would then, even though it's, you know, zone uh, agriculture, but we want it to be for rural or, or housing or things like that, you know, with the housing crisis that we have right now, uh, be it affordable or whatever. Um, they seem to be, in, in my understanding of those community development plans, an important tool that can be used uh, when you do have to approach the Land Use Commission. Any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think they are an important tool or can be an important tool. Um, the challenges that I've seen is a lot of the, the I've seen this wave of, how, of this housing issue coming. It's been coming and coming and coming. And actions that were taken within some of these CDPs at the time were very anti development. So to get them back on board with more, how do we solve for our needs would be critical. The challenge that I'm running into is the feeding that beast all the way around to update a CDP is probably two to three years and around $300,000, right? So now that I finished a general plan, I got to chase around every single CDP, which is of course of over at least 12 or 15 years to get those current. And then by then, probably the next one's somewhat obsolete. So trying to um, do something strategic right now to really help move that along, I think it's gonna be key. And yes, it would be very helpful that they're in alignment. It's just uh, not as easy to get there as, as one would hope. Zendo, this is Capono. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on your current timeline for getting the general plan to County Council by 2024? Like what is the process that it's gonna go through? How many you know, public hearings do you have to have? Things like that. And do you have, um, I guess, stepping points to reach that overall goal? Yeah, um, sure. And then I'll, I'll pick up on uh, Alexander's question right after that. So the CDP right now, the remainder of the year is really about stabilization, going through these two drafts and creating a fresh, complete, good, solid draft. Uh, with that, we're doing some uh, kind of large um, stakeholder conversations. Once we get that draft stabilized uh, and we co we'll come out in 23, beginning of 23, for public outreach and comments. We'll be holding a series of uh, public meetings, uh, some in person, probably some on Zoom. Say, here's the plan, guys. You know, beat it up, tell us good things, tell us negative things, whatever you want. And we'll go through that process probably for the first quarter or so of 23. And then we'll take that back. We'll make some adjustments. We'll make some tweaks to it. Uh, send it out one more time. Here it is. And then we're going to move it into the clock is ultimately taking into planning commission mode. So from there, probably quarter Q3 of 23, we'll be going up to the planning commissions. Both planning commissions have to review it. There'll be public hearings there as well. But it's more now like here's what we really want it to be and the public hearings will be getting input feedback some will like it some won't and that's where the commission will then make some tweaks and adjustments to it possibly but prior to that submittal is where we'll be able to have more control and gain that feedback so really 23 is that feedback mode tweak adjust 
end of 23, commissioned beginning of 24. It'll go through its journey to the county council and it'll go through a series of hearings at the county council. And I suspect it'll be there a while because it's, it's a pretty large document. Does that make sense, Kwon? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, see, Alexander's question here, guessing that NIMBYism is coming from homeowners associations, would that be correct assumption? Are there other things that should be done to consider such groups with lots of capital aside from the younger involved? You know, it's a, it's actually a real mixture where we're getting the uh, NIMBYism for. Uh, one of our last hearings we had, I uh, had a guy that uh, testified and he said, you know, I, I moved here two years ago because I like the way that it is and I don't want anything to change for uh, down to homeowners associations saying they don't want it or, or neighbors saying that they don't want it. And oftentimes people just don't understand or they don't want their life to change. The irony is I see it happen all the time where somebody is in a development, residential development, curb gutter sidewalks, nice streets, nice homes all around. And then it's like, hey, we need to expand and we're going to do another plot next door. And then those neighbors come out against it. So it's really a broad, broad range uh, of folks. And I think having more uh, awareness out there and I think getting the next I, I really truly believe that having the younger generation voice out there will make a big difference because um got, got a long ways to go and the way that it is it isn't very good any other questions for Rizendo yes yeah, and I got one last question it's Capono again um what are the community development plan action committees doing right now? Because I think I'm signed up for like an email blast for updates, but all I'm getting is like Albizio workshops or stuff like that. Are they actually working on changing any of these CDPs? Um, the CDP ACE, the CDP ACs or the action committees um, have not so much been focused on the CDPs. I've been trying to get like other projects and whatnot going in their communities. Like Kona has been a good one that's gotten some traction with the Kona open, open space network. And so they're more focused on projects at, than related to amending the CDP. In order to amend the CDP, we'll have to initiate that and actually get funding for it in the whole process. And then we would start collecting feedback from them or probably even create a new steering committee. The action committee was supposed to be there to really try to drive actions home. But we found that it's quite challenging uh, and resource heavy. So we're looking at adjusting some of that possibly to just make it a bit more bit more actionable. For example, they have to follow sunshine law. So they get out in their community and they're at a meeting that isn't sanctioned and there's three of them there. All of a sudden they're worried about violating sunshine law. So it's kind of like they're working on some things, but not nearly the level that they should be. Um, so I'd say it's kind of the CDP ACs right now need some focus and attention. So one of the things I just had them, I, I did was um, we sent out a request to them to say, what are the most important projects in your community you believe as it relates to capital improvement um, and potential uh, federal grants that we're going to get? So we gathered info from them. They provided that, but then I'm giving it to um, R&D for their evaluation as, as projects are coming through for grants. But honest truth, CDPACs need some, some tweaks and adjustment to make them more actionable. So how is that going to happen then so that your general plan fits, especially you mentioned that Mensler case, like it, will there be issue with the general plan if it doesn't fit the community development plans? There, not so much. If the general plan still overrides that we can come and say, hey, the general plan's overriding. The gen where, where there's a discrepancy, the general plan still overrides. Where we found is the general plan was light with information. So the CDP was really pushing in their heavy, taking control over it. So we're trying to adjust some of those tweaks right now by way of the GP fixing some of those loopholes while we then come back and, sh and hopefully adjust those CDPs to be more um, dynamic and fluid. Okay, so the process is to fix G, uh, general plan first and then fix CDPs and later? And then CDPs, yeah. Okay. Because still the GP will be your overriding hardcore document. But like I say, it's kind of light in some areas. So then it's like, well, the CDP says this, and so we got to do that. And so trying to eliminate those areas of conflict for the betterment of our community. All right, well... I don't think there's any more questions. 
If not, uh, you can you can feel free to send questions via email to Taylor, and then we can send those out back to Zendo and his team for any um, clarification or answers. At this time, I want to thank Zendo for his time and his expertise. And I do want to remind everybody on this call that um, if you do have uh, chamber members or if you have friends or members of the chamber, please uh, invite them to attend our uh, YP uh, events. Um, when we have these lunch and learns, they're not just for, you know, the age group 21 to 39, they are open to the public and to our membership. So please feel free to invite them. And with that, um, we'll be on for a little while if anybody wants to talk story, but if not, have a nice week and thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity guys. Be well, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you, Zendo.